Jonathan Edwards once wrote, he who does not receive the gospel with its difficulties does not receive it as offered. They who do not receive Christ with his cross as well as crown do not truly receive him. You know, if there ever was a man who lived and lived at the time of Jonathan Edwards that he was describing as one who kind of carried his cross, not Christ's cross, but carried his own, as Jesus talked about, and went through great difficulties and ultimately received his crown, was none other than the great late missionary, David Brainerd. We're going to look at the life of David Brainerd over the next couple ep episodes or so. Uh, I am concerned about Christian thinking these days, and what better way to do that than to go into the life of David Brainerd and look at him because Jonathan Edwards saw this man, this very man, as an example of how the Christian life should be lived. Greetings. Welcome to Two Days Denarius. I'm Ron Thomas, and let's get started. I'm holding in my hand right now a gift uh, that was from a dear colleague, friend of mine. Uh, it's an 1826 edition of the life of the Reverend David Brainerd, missionary to the Native Americans, or as then they said, missionary to the Indians. And this was put together by none other than the Reverend Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, which really this particular work of Jonathan Edwards, which was made into a book, and it's yay thick, I mean, it's, it is sizable. Uh, Jonathan Edwards really was the editor of David Brainerd's journals. David Brainerd really left some highly documented uh, journals about his feelings, what he was experiencing, of his sufferings, uh, his moments of joy. Uh, it really is one of the most well thought out, well written uh, journals in all of Christian history. Uh, so I treasure this. It's 1826. If I could show you some of the pages, people have signed their name in it. It's like this book has been passed on up through generations, and I look forward to writing my name in here as well. Uh, if you looked at my picture of my thumbnail to this video, I'm standing at David Brainerd Hall at uh, Yale Divinity School. David Brainerd was a student there once and uh, he did not have a good experience while he was there, uh, but we will go into detail about that in a little while. As I said in the introduction, one of my big concerns today uh, is the la what's lacking uh, really in Christian thought, Christian expression, uh, expectations, how Christians uh, should live. I really feel like we've lost an identity in the Christian faith in these modern times. And what is this life? What is this Christian life supposed to look like? And I think now it's time really to go back. And even the great Martin Lloyd-Jones says, if you're going to read and you're going to study and you're going to look at devotionals, you need to go back to the 17 or 1800s. Don't read anything in these modern times. And I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of truth to that. I think that... Uh, where we're at today in the age of trite social media, uh, people just writing these little tweets, I see them all the time. Uh, most of them are, are thoughtless comments. Uh, you get few that really expect, express uh, any real uh, meaningful spiritual thought. That's hard to do when you only have 280 characters on certain site, uh, one in particular, but uh, uh, one of them has really gotten, uh, I think, the evangelical message off in a big way. But having said that, uh, we need to look at the life a little bit of David Brainerd. Let's kind of get to, to know this man. Well, I uh, read his journal back when I was in the college days. And I'll tell you, I've, to this day, there's not a book like it. This book truly is unique. Uh, it really, the nature of this man how he lived, what he went through uh, growing up, uh, his experience in college and then on the mission field. Uh, you really, it's unmatched. It's kind of a non pareil it's unequaled. And I think that one of the things that David Brainerd gives us, because he suffered from what they called it then uh, melancholy, 
uh, really is depression. He had a pretty severe depressive uh, syndrome. And I do believe if he were living in modern times, uh, he would probably be very much um, uh, somebody be a mental health patient uh, just because uh, you read the nature of his journals and stuff, it's pretty evident. And it was known then, even Jonathan Edwards knew that because uh, he wrote about it. Uh, in the preface to the journal, uh, he wrote about David Bra uh, Brainerd's, what he called melancholy or his, his depression and his despondency. And it's very evident many times, many times when people will read this particular journal, and it happened to me too. You start reading about the first 50 to 60 pages of it, and you're going, oh my Lord, <laughs> I can hardly handle this. this. This guy is really, really down in the dumps. Is this what the Christian life's supposed to look like? Uh, well, you know what, sometimes it is. And what the, one of the great writers, John Bunyan, great Puritan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, I, I encourage you to read that book sometime, wrote about a period of time on Christian's journey, it's an allegory, uh, where he got caught in a slow of despond, where he got caught up in a despondency for X amount of time. It was a significant period, and it was kind of a miraculous way that he got out of that. But uh, you know what? For those who always say that Christians are always supposed to be happy, gleeful, uh, uh, you don't know the Christian life. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was one who was given to depression. There have been other great heroes of the Christian faith who have been given to things like depression or other. Oh, oh actually, my, one of my favorite hymn writers of all time, William Cooper of England, lived in 1700s too, or whenever the time John Newton, author of Amazing Grace, lived. Um, hey, <laughs> He, he had enough suicide ideations to try to commit suicide twice in his life as a believer, but he was noted as one of the great English poets, and uh, we sing some of his hymns to this very day. Uh, you never discount a Christian, okay? Many times we struggle. David Brainerd is a good example uh, for those who do struggle with things like mental health. I'll talk about that more later because in this episode, I'm going to read you some of the very clear uh, despondent type entries uh, in David Brainerd's journal. Um, you know, Christian, there's always hope. Even if you struggle with such a thing um, as uh, a mental health depression or whatever uh, you've been diagnosed with. So, all right, well, let's look at his life. David Brainerd was born in 1718. Uh, he was born in uh, uh, Haddam, Connecticut. And actually, you can see pictures there. I visited, I visited David Brainerd's uh, home in Haddam. Uh, I, his house isn't there anymore. You can just see in the picture that there's that stone with the plaque on the rock. That's the location where the house was. And on the side of the road where that rock is, it was on uh, actually across the street uh, at that time where his home actually was. Uh, so I had to take the opportunity while I was still out there to go visit couple of places of my theological heroes and I actually had visited the home of Jonathan Edwards and you can see his home and Jonathan Edwards uh, was born in what was then called East Windsor, Connecticut but today is called South Windsor, uh, Connecticut. So basically long on, I don't want to go too long into his uh, earlier years but there are some significant things there. One is depressive syndromes did run in his family. Another thing is shortness of life ran into his family. So one of the Brainerds in 1865 wrote that it was very common for depression uh, to run in that particular family. The Brainerds, they said, it was very rare if anybody met the age of around 65. The David Brainerd's life, he was the sixth of nine children, a big family, uh, as you can tell. It was actually, uh, they were farmers. And uh, David's mom died when he was nine years old. Uh, she obviously had three more children after him. And then uh, David's father, who was part of the city government there, in, additionally, in addition to the farm, uh, he passed away when David was 14. So after that, uh, David went to live at his sister's house across the river in East Haddam, Connecticut. And uh, his sister, Jerusha, uh, don't mix this Jerusha up, with Jonathan Edwards' daughter, Jerusha. These are not the same people. This was Jerusha Brainerd. 
And actually she died when she was around 34 years old. So she was one of the brainers who didn't have a long life. Uh, I have a list of the numbers, but this uh, depression and shortness of life uh, seem to run uh, in the Brainerd family. Spiritually, uh, David Brainerd, uh, he, David Brainerd kind of knew the Bible, but David Brainerd was actually uh, kind of a self-righteous guy. Uh, he, <laughs> he wanted to go study ministry. He wanted, he planned to go into the ministry, uh, but around the age of uh, 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, he actually inherited the farm. And he was going to take up farming for a while, but he, he didn't like it at all. So he set his sights on the ministry because he did want to be a minister. He had no plans to be a missionary. Uh, he wanted to go to school, study, be a scholarly type, and uh, have a pastorate or, or certainly uh, you know, teach uh, in the semina uh, seminaries uh, someday. Spiritually, he was lost. And he saw himself as a, as a self-righteous person like Jonathan Edwards, he struggled with the sovereignty of God. Um, he struggled. He felt it wasn't fair uh, that God would impute sin upon all mankind just because of Adam's sin. And the Bible says that because of Adam's sin, so therefore sin spread to all, man, all mankind. All, all of us are born sinners. Well, David Brainerd didn't kind of like that doctrine. He found it... Uh, unfair, he found it unjust, in addition to the sovereignty of God. Uh, there was one other doctrine he struggled with as well. That one slips my mind at this time. So in the end, what David Brainerd struggled with was, is in, in the writings it says, uh, he, was, he didn't like the fact that he could not do in his own strength. He could not commend himself to God or gain God's favor uh, through his own strength. And he wrote, all my good frames were but self-righteousness. All he was about was self-righteousness. He, he saw himself as okay. I mean, he didn't think that all the sin in the world and the largeness of it should affect him. And, and so he really uh, became hardened uh, because of these doctrines he, he disagreed with. And uh, he said, all my good frames were but self-righteousness not bottom on a desire for the glory of God. And that's interesting because he all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when you look at a reference to that, uh, and all are sinners and we fall short, David Brainerd struggled with this very uh, thing, which was really because of his own pride. And I'll just tell you, this is the common, common thread to all mankind to reject Jesus Christ is because of their own pride and all that things. And here David Brainerd wanted to be a ministry, go into the ministry, and he was an unsaved man. Well, not for long. <laughs> so around 21, age 21, and here at this time, uh, he was giving process of giving up the farm, planning to go to Yale, go into the ministry. And again, at this point, unsaved until July 12th. 1739. It is interesting because I want to look at the account of this for a moment. And as I've said in other things, I've told you the, the basically the life spiritual journey of Jonathan Edwards in the past. So let's talk about David Brainerd's. David Brainerd, the supernatural, divine and supernatural light experience, very similar to what happened with Jonathan Edwards. Very similar. All right. July 12, 1739. He was age 21. And he was getting ready two months after this event. He was going to, going into Yale uh, to study. Now he writes, As I was walking in a dark, thick grave, unspeakable glory seemed to open to view and apprehension of it in my soul. It was a new inward apprehension of the view that I had of God, such as I never had before, nor anything that I had the least remembrance of it. It's so that I stood still and wondered and admired. I had now no particular apprehension of any one person of the Trinity, either the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, but it appeared to be the divine glory and splendor that, and that, that I then believed. And my soul rejoiced with joy unspeakable to see that such a God, such a glorious being, 
the very glorious being he was fighting against. And I was inwardly pleased and satisfied that he should be God over all forever and ever. Amazing. All of a sudden, the divine supernatural light struck him out of nowhere, just like Jonathan Edwards. I just tell you, friends, this is how salvations happened in those days. People came to that realization. People were just suddenly, uh, something happened to them. It struck them right into the heart and changed them. Their lives were new. They were changed forever. This is the divine and supernatural light. These, where are these types of salvation experiences today? David Brainerd, in one moment of time, became a new creature. He rose, went forth, and followed Jesus Christ for the rest of his life. All right, the farm was sold. Now, when he got to college, he suffered illnesses. In fact, in 1740, the first time, the first signs of appearance of tuberculosis, this is the part I didn't tell you yet, because tuberculosis kind of ran in the Brainerd family as well, uh, his mother died of tuberculosis, and David was very close to his mom and took care of her. So it, it maybe happened that he somehow acquired it from her and maybe had a delayed response reaction to it. But in 1739, his first year of school, he was a good student, but he was struggling with illness during that whole year. And then in 1740, um, the first signs, he had to be sent home during the year because he was coughing up blood. And those were the first signs of the tuberculosis uh, showing up in his body. But what was happening in 1740 and 1741, these were the periods of the great revival. George Whitfield, probably the greatest preacher, revival preacher of that era. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, the minister, really, of the revival. Uh, Sinners in the hang Hands of an Angry God in 1741. Uh, among others, there were other revival preachers in that time. And uh, they were going around preaching in places. Uh, George Whitfield preached at Yale. Uh, there was a man named Pemberton and Noah Bellamy. Uh, these were hot on fire revivalists. And the students at the school were getting on fire. And one of them was David Brainerd. He was almost leading the charge. Uh, the, however, the staff and the professors and the administration at, that, at Yale at that time, at that seminary, uh, were getting very concerned and felt it was time to do something. Nobody was respected more than Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was the dude, plain and simple. He was the mind, brilliant through and through, and he was the esteemed pastor of that church up in Northampton, Massachusetts. And by the way, the, the church that Jonathan Edwards pastored there in Northampton was the second largest church in Massachusetts at that time. It was a congregation of around 600, uh, second only to a church, as you would expect, that was actually uh, in Boston. So be sure that Jonathan Edwards, through his writings, and, and certainly at a, at a large community church like that that he pastored, uh, was very highly respected. So given that, he got an invitation in 1741 to come down and preach because they, the faculty and the administration at Yale felt like Jonathan Edwards could come down and put a little water on this fire here and kind of cool it off. And they were hoping that Jonathan Edwards would do that. Now, you're never going to tell a man what to preach, but I'm sure they gave him hints to say, Jay, you know, Jonathan, you need to help settle these guys down a little bit, okay? Uh, they're causing too much fervor around this school, and we're trying to teach them to be good ministers. Well, Jonathan Edwards doesn't always do what you expect that he's going to do. And when Jonathan Edwards preached, he actually poured more fuel on the fire instead of trying to put the water, uh, put water on it. Um, he preached a sermon called The Distinguishing Marks of a Work of the Spirit of God. Jonathan Edwards was such a student of revival. We have some great, great stuff that he writ, wrote to this day uh, that he has left behind. Um, but that sermon totally dis disappointed the staff. They were very upset about it. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was there defending the revival. It's not what they called him there to do. This was graduation day. And guess who was one of the students in the crowd that day? was none other than David Brainerd, and it set David Brainerd even more on fire. So 
What Edwards did led, led the school to create a rule the very next day. And that rule was written, and this, this is the word, wording. If any student in this college shall directly or indirectly say that the rector, either of the trustees, tutors, or hypocrites, or tutors or hypocrites, carnal or unconverted men, he shall for the first offense make a public confession in the hall, and for the second offense be expelled. Now, that's interesting, remember that. First offense, make an apology at the hall. The second offense is the one that sends you home. Now, David Brainerd was a rascal in school because he was one who was really one of the people who was, uh, he was very much on fire. Um, he was actually older than most of the students. Many of the students at Yale at that time came in at about age 16. David Brainerd came in when he was 21. And not only that, because at the school, uh, you had to, if you were a freshman or you were a younger student, you had to give deference to uh, the seniors. And those seniors could be around even 18 years old or a little younger than that. So David Brainerd probably struggled with some of that, but given that he was 21, a little, more, a little older, he probably was a little bit more free with what he said. And he made some mistakes. Even mistakes that later on that he acknowledged uh, and really sought forgiveness. Uh, he wanted to go back to school. He wanted to be a minister. He wanted to reconcile this. Uh, and it was something he carried this type of uh, grief and the trauma from it for the rest of his life. But here's what happened. Um, in 1742, now David Brainerd would have graduated in 1743. If you look at the thumbnail of my video again, and I have a picture at the end of this, you can see on that picture on uh, David Brainerd Hall there at Yale Divinity School, it says 1743. So he would have been 1743 of that class. Uh, but in 1742, he was top of the class. He was the best student. We say that. However, he was overheard saying uh, about one of the tutors whose name was Chauncey Whittlesley. He said that Charles Whittlesley has no more grace than a chair. You say, why would somebody get thrown at that? Well, it was an opportunity for the school to weed out the ones they felt that were full of zeal at the time, caught up in the revival fire, and make a point, make an example. David Brainerd was seen as the leader. He was the top student, and he was also seen as one who was given uh, to give criticism and stuff within the school. And here was the chance for them to give, show him the door. And then he also said he wondered why the rector of the school did not drop down dead for finding students for their evangelical zeal. Now remember the rule for the first offense. You make an apology in the hall. So here's your offense right there. David Brainerd not got, never got a chance to do that. He was tossed from the school and never lapped back in. He had some of the greatest ministers, including Jonathan Edwards, appeal to the school to let David Brainerd back in so he could get in there and graduate the last year. And, and again, he was so ready and, and multiple times apologized for his actions. Uh, David Brainerd was truly, truly hurt and traumatized. And I do believe, he, from what I have read, was very sorry uh, for what he did. Through the years, he tried to make things right, but you know, the one thing he probably wanted in life never happened, but what God did in his life and what God left behind, sometimes the way those things add up, uh, a greater glory is achieved. Now being in a position um, where he had his dreams of ministry and scholarship ended, he really, he had to do a reset, a replanning of his whole life. Uh, you know, that could be something that happens to you and me, you know, examine your life and Think about where you've been in positions where you have had to think and rethink and uh, what, what do I do now? Well, David Brainerd was put in uh, to that position, but little did he know that he would become one of the greatest missionaries of all time. So having said that, he was given the opportunity to serve as missionary to the Native Americans or the Indians. Uh, I, I use the words interchangeably, and that's certainly not a disrespect, but in those days they were, they were called Indians, and it was a respectful term. The minister, 
The missionaries of those times and the ministers were very respectful to the Native American community. But he started in a place, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which was further west than Northampton, uh, in uh, April of 1743. He was tutored by a missionary, a veteran missionary named John Sargent, and he worked his first assignment following that with the Housatonic Indians uh, at Quantameek. Quantameek, which was 20 miles northwest of Stockbridge, and he rode to New Jersey then to be examined by the Newark Presbytery, and he was ordained as a minister on June 11, 1744. So his missionary journeys are starting here. And in the process of that, you're, you see this, a lot of the writings from the missionary journeys in this book. I don't want to forget to say that, but one of the fascinating things, one of the most fascinating things that you see about David Brainerd, and he rode probably a few thousand miles on horseback. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was a guy who loved nature. Jonathan Edwards did write about nature. David Brainerd was completely different. All the things you'll ever read in this journal, you'll never ever write about the beauty of nature. And he, he, wrote, you know, he certainly wrote through the beauty of nature at times, like in the autumns and stuff like that, but he never wrote about that. It's kind of strange. But I'll tell you what, at times he suffered by nature. He suffered in storms. Uh, he, he suffered loss of his horse one time. Uh, he suffered loss of spoiling of food uh, on missionary journeys. Things that almost busted him and broke him. His sickness would hit him at times and he couldn't move. He'd be paralyzed for a while. Yeah, he almost died on multiple occasions. I don't know, you think about it, if you understand his history of doing these missionary journeys then and going out alone and, uh, to the mission field like he did, uh, how did he make it? Well, let's call it God's providence. Let's call it God's providence. So after that, uh, Brainerd preached to the Indians at the forks of the Delaware River uh, for one year. And then on June 19, 1745, he made his first preaching uh, to the Indians or at Cross Week Sun, then Cross Week Sun, uh, New Jersey. Now, understand, and this is another thing, I encourage you to get the Banner of Truth publisher's version of the Journal of David Brainerd. Get that, The Life of David Brainerd, it's, it's such a valuable book to have. But Banner of Truth Publishers probably has the best edition of that. Uh, I looked at uh, Apple Books uh, on my iP iPad and stuff and, and Kindle. Uh, you can get copies of that. But the Banner of Truth has the real version of it. And it's, it's so well worth the read. I get a copy of it. But all up to this point, David Brainerd was very discouraged so many times because the Indians, they were never responsive. He would go preach the good news to them. And it wasn't that they didn't like him. They did. Two things that David Brainerd did that were significant. One is that instead of living separately from the Native Americans at that time, he actually lived there in their community whenever he went to these places like Cross Week Sun, Quantameek. So that was an innovation. Now, other missionaries, none, nobody else had ever done that. The second one was he was the first missionary uh, to wear the clothing of the people that he was going to serve as a missionary. So David Brainerd was actually bringing innovations in that other missionaries followed thereafter. So those were two of the significant ones, among others, that he also uh, put in as well. So after this, at Cross Weeksung, for the first time in all the prayers, and again, you read the journal, you just see him crying to God always that people would hear the word good news and receive Christ among the Indians. Guess what? It happened. It happened at Cross Weeksung, New Jersey, uh, when he was there in 1745. He wrote about it. There were about 130 converts. And understand, 130, that's a big number in those days. And so after that point, he started developing a community. And he actually moved 
uh, moved the tribes to a different place, not far away from Cross Weeksung. But he was establishing an assembly of believers there, hoping they would be a, a community that would grow and spread among the other Native Americans uh, there uh, in the Northeast. So here David Brainerd was starting to see God's glory happen. And as you might expect, not long afterward, then he got sick. So he stayed there until he was too sick to minister. And then in November 1746, Cross Weeks and then became named Cranberry. And so he left there to go to Elizabethtown to stay with a pastor because he needed to recover. Uh, he needed to recover and stayed at the home of Jonathan Dickinson, a pastor there in Elizabethtown, a noted pastor, stayed with them for healing. Not only that, something significant happened when while David Brainerd was at that house of Jonathan Dickinson, there was a College of New Jersey that was begun. The College of New Jersey later became Princeton Seminary, Princeton University. David Brainerd was present at the time of Princeton Seminary being started, Princeton University. I don't think it was an accident. Some think that this occurrence happened because of what happened at Yale that many evangelical ministers were very concerned of what was going on with Yale and saw the need to start another school. And there you go, David Brainerd was there right in the middle of it, even though he was only there for six months. So around March 20th of 1747, Brainerd made one last trip uh, to visit his Indian friends there, or the converts there in Cranberry. And then he rode off to Northampton, Massachusetts to stay at the home of Jonathan Edwards uh, after that. So he got there around May of 1747, um, made one trip to Boston, and then he passed away at the home of Jonathan Edwards on October 9th, 1747. Now it's an interesting story, and you, you can see a picture of the grave of David Brainerd there. I uh, went ahead and put the picture of Jerusha Edwards right next to him. Jerusha Edwards was 17 years old, and she took care of Jonathan Edwards. She was the one that Jonathan said, I want you to nurse David Brainerd until he dies. And uh, she did. Um, some think that Jerusha and David were engaged. and They kind of romanticize the story, but I want to be frank and honest, there's no evidence of that. Uh, is it coincidental that they were buried together? I don't know. Is it possible that they had a future plan to wed? Anything's possible. <laughs> but I'm just saying is we don't, we don't know for fact. But nevertheless, they are buried together, as you saw in the picture. And, uh, and the story has kind of been romanticized sometimes uh, without the best of evidence on that. Jonathan Edwards never uh, wrote anything to that fact at all. Uh, so, so we really don't know. Um, but that was the life, basically, of David Brainerd. And, uh, so, so I try to help you get a little bit to know the man we're talking about. But one of the significant things about David Brainerd is you have to look at his depression. And the depression, it was, it was significant. And Jonathan Edwards addressed it. And I want you to put, let's get Jonathan Edwards' words and how he saw David Brainerd's depression. In Edwards' time, some people were saying about depression that uh, it, religion and stuff was just there to, for these depressed people to spread wild emotion in them and get them all stirred up. And, and Jonathan Edwards didn't agree with that. Jonathan Edwards made a note that noted that people who are given to spiritual enthusiasm, you know, spiritual enthusiasm, you know, think of the Kevin Copeland stirring up the crowds and people getting caught up in that. They tend to be people who are easily emotionally charged anyway. It's not people with depression. Uh, who, who do that. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was correct. He was a student of revival. Believe me, he knew this inside out. He said that, that didn't apply to Jonathan Edwards. And here's what he wrote. Those who were already high in emotional disposition, who were easily led and driven, those were the ones who were easily led and driven in spiritual enthusiasm. This is true and you see it, oh, and I was, this is my note. These things are true because you see it in our church today. It's it's, it's done through music, it's done through the faith healing, it's done in many preferred churches today where people just try to get you rah, 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 stirred up. But further, what Jonathan Edwards said about David Brainerd's depression, before I read some quotes on him, he said, notwithstanding, 
his inclination to despondency or depression, uh, he was evidently one of the sorts of persons who were usually were the furthest from a wild imagination. So Jonathan Edwards personally knew David Brainerd. He knew he was not one that was given to emotion, is what he's saying, and enthusiasm. So count that out. Being one of a penetrating genius of clear thought, close reasoning, and very exact judgment, as all know and that knew him. All of them knew that David Brainerd, everybody who knew David Brainerd knew him, knew this guy was sharp and not emotional, nor was he driven to emotion. So they knew that. He was able to most accurately distinguish between real and solid piety, real and solid faith. He knew what was real and what was fake, and enthusiasm. He knew when the excesses were happening. He knew what it looked like. And we talk about the religious affections. You're going to know what enthusiasm looks like, because I'm getting ready to do Jonathan Edwards' religious affections uh, in the not-too-distant future. All right. Uh, he knew the excesses between those experiences that are rational and the ones that are scriptural. Listen to what Edwards wrote here. And those vehement emotions of the animal spirits that arise from them. Isn't that something? <laughs> Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17, plain and simple. All scripture is inspired by God or it's breathed out by God. The Greek word is theos neustas. And it exactly means that it's breathed out by God. God breathed and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The problem we have today is people aren't reading their Bibles. If we were doing that and our churches were teaching scripture, we would have so much of this stuff under control. And once again, we would be made properly making those distinctions as Jonathan Edwards just described here between enthusiasm and what is real faith. Like I say, when we get into religious affections, you're going to know what that looks like. <clears throat> All right, having said that, we'll go ahead and read a few of his quotes on his depression. And you know, what I'm going to read here is just a sampling because in the book itself, this happens actually kind of more often than you would ever imagine. And sometimes you're just going to say, well, this man is so down all the time. But when you get to the rejoicing part of his life, of what happens at Cross Weekson, hey, it's a totally different thing. You got to take the journey. You really do. It's, it's, it's an amazing journey through the journal, the diary, the life of the Reverend uh, David Brainerd. All right, Sunday, December 16, 1744. Was so overwhelmed with dejection that I knew not how to live. I longed for death exceedingly. My soul was sunk in deep waters, and the floods were ready to drown me. I was so much oppressed that my soul was a kind of horror. You're going to read many quotes like that when you read this book. I want you to give you a taste about how, of how serious the dejection, uh, depression, the melancholy of David Brainerd was. Now some will contend that David Brainerd just went through so much on that mission field, got uh, tossed out of the college, he carried so much hurt and pain, he had tuberculosis too, and all that's true. But the question is, did he really have what could be diagnosed as some form of depression? And I would contend, having read this and read sections of it over and over again, it's, it's hard to say that, I, I can't believe that he didn't. I would think that he did. Uh, Tuesday, September 2nd, 1746. Was scarce ever more confounded with a sense of my own unfruitfulness and unfitness of my work than now. Oh, what a dead, heartless, barren, unprofitable wretch did I now see myself to be. My spirits were so low and my body strength so wasted that I could do nothing at all. At length, being much overdone, lay down on a buffalo skin, but sweat much of the whole night. Again, you're going to see things like this from David Brainerd. Uh, and you know, Paul called himself the chief of sinners. At times you see in scripture when Paul wrote about himself and stuff, he, wasn't, he was serious when he wrote that, when he said, oh, wretched man that I am. 
uh, Paul was being very serious about that stuff. And you see that here in the, in the life of the Christian man, David Brainerd. Um, you know, this is the thing. This is the thing that's missing because Christians, any Christian who thinks that they've arrived, I really worry about them. All of us are Christians, the closer we get to God, we, we feel like we, we're, we're such failures. I mean, we really do. We long to be closer to God, but the closer we get to them, the more we see ourselves like this, like what I just read. And consider that, because when we talk about God and being a holy God, a perfect God and stuff like that, uh, if you long to be close to God, you're gonna have moments of time where you're going to see yourself who you really are. And you're not always going to be happy with that picture that you see. All right, let's go ahead and look at one more. This comes from January 23rd, uh, 1743, uh, probably in the early portion where he was beginning to minister to the Indians. And, I, you know, this is a man who felt very unworthy for the work that he was called to do. Certainly had inner struggles uh, with it, but... Uh, you know, as you read through the journal, you will understand why David Brainerd many times responded uh, to things like he did here. And with immense, incredible, uh, incredible, almost morbid uh, introspection uh, that really leaves you with a weird feeling. Uh, you adjust to that as you read the book more, but you begin to see this is a man who's ha really had one of the greatest and strongest hearts that you, uh, for God that you will ever read. But here's what he said on this day. He said, scarce ever felt myself so unfit to exist as now. I saw that I was not worthy of a place among the Indians where I am going. None knows but those that feel it. What the soul endures that is sensibly shut out from the presence of this God. Alas, it's tis more bitter than death. Wow, you know, I'm just gonna tell you, you, you can't understand David Brainerd without being aware of his depressive nature. It is significant. Uh, you know, this is a man, he had a shattered life dream. He suffered with tuberculosis. He went to a ministry he had never planned to minister. Uh, certainly in his family, wise, uh, suffered a lot of loss. Uh, so really, in a sense, in David Brainerd's life, uh, there was never a dull moment. Maybe there was never a chance to recover. And certainly when you're living your life with a huge depressive syndrome or melancholy, what they called it, uh, in those days, you can see uh, the man's struggles. You can see his response to them. But you can see something glorious too. And one of the glorious parts of the journey comes in Psalm 42, verses 5 to 8. You know, I want to speak to those of you out there who do struggle uh, as Christians with mental health. Or even if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to come to Christ. Because one of the things, the greatest thing in David Brainerd's life that he had was Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Absolutely the greatest thing. What would David Brainerd's life been if he was a minister studying for the minister, ministry and he did not know the Lord? Uh, what would he have done to himself? There's no end, uh, really no end to the thinking uh, that he would get tuberculosis uh, during uh, that time frame when he was in school. Uh, going there at a school and everything where he didn't believe and have that sickness, have maybe a case where he did or didn't get thrown out of school, uh, it would have been very difficult for him. Far more difficult if he would have remained a lost man than by God coming in and giving him the divine and supernatural light and bringing him to the Lord. Because oftentimes you see David finding refuge, refuge in the Lord. Psalm 42, verses 5 through 8, is really beautiful when it comes to this. And I want to say to you out there, maybe use this as a reference, uh, my friends, Christians, because the writer of this particular psalm, it wasn't David, apparently, uh, but this really goes and looks at some of those things that we struggle with sometimes. And I want to go ahead and read it and take heart as you do listen. And, uh, I do want to say, too, there's a book out there you can get and you see it there in the photo. It's called Spiritual Depression by Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, we'll say Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a doctor who became a minister. And he, understand, he understood this stuff very well. But I will say that Martin Lloyd-Jones was an advocate that if you needed to go seek medical help for things like depression and stuff that went beyond 
anything normal. You was beyond your ability to manage. Uh, Martin Lloyd Jones was an advocate of certainly people receiving help. But in the normal course and run of life, when sometimes those deep depressions come, he was certainly an advocate of fleeing to God and fleeing to his word. So let's read this now for some encouragement. Uh, for those of you, like I said, this is for those of you uh, who have experience uh, with, with uh, mental health issues. Any, but any among us can struggle and suffer at times with spiritual depression. And sometimes it can be longer than others. But at least for now, at least this one moment of time together, let's take some solace in the Word of God. Psalm 42, 5 through 8 says, Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise Him, my Savior and my God. I am deeply depressed. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mitzar. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in Israel. It's 8,000 feet high. Like three quarters of the year, it has snow on it. And that snow, when it melts, it provides water to uh, the cities in the area. So Mount Hermon is significant. Uh, some scholars believe Mount Hermon is actually where the transfiguration of Jesus Christ took place. Do we know? Absolutely no way to know, but it's a possibility. Uh, traditionally, it's considered to be Mount Tabor, which I'm not sure how far away that is from Hermon. Uh, but the picture there is a place of refreshing, all right? Coming to God off time, when you, when you see rivers in the Bible, or you see mountains in, presented this way, it's a picture of that refreshing that we need. So verse 7 says, Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and billows have swept over me. The Lord will send his faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. <clears throat> I just want to encourage you, really, uh, take, take some solace. Take some time to seek the Lord. Take some time to meditate upon his word. Just take some time to close your eyes, read this word before you do, and picture what God can do uh, in our lives. These are things that can help us in such times to get those thoughts under control, uh, ease, manage those anxieties, things that cause us to just freeze and to stop in our lives. Uh, take time to do that. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know, this can be yours if you come to him in faith. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. David Brainerd knew that his life fell short of the glory of God, but he didn't care. He didn't feel it was fair that God would impute him with Adam's sin. But the fact is that he did, and he does. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God because of our sin. And the only way for us to be made right is to come to faith in him through Jesus Christ, his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? If you don't, you take time to close your eyes and pray and ask him to come to you. Confess to him that you're a sinner. That's the first thing you got to do. We, there's only one thing we bring to the cross. There's only one thing we bring to the Lord when it comes to salvation, and that's our sin. And we ask him, we confess that we are sinners. We ask him, forgive us and cleanse us, that the blood of Christ will cleanse us from all our sin. And we ask to receive him as our Lord and Savior. And understand, Lord means that now he is our owner, he is our master, and our Savior. He is the one who saved us from this present world, the evil of this present world, and to spend eternity with him. And have that relationship that God had intended us to have throughout eternity. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you do those things now. And, and you can contact me on this, on my email address at twodaysdenarius at gmail.com or twodaysdenarius at gmail.com. I am so uh, look forward there to hear from you if you come to know Jesus, Lord and Savior, and be happy to help you find a church then. Because after that, you need to find a lo good local Bible-believing church to attend. 
Okay, I just want to say that May 5th is National Prayer Day, so please, on uh, National Prayer Day, plan to take some time to say prayers on my podcast, which is available on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, and other sites. I do plan to say a prayer for the nation, which I have begun to annually do. So uh, you can look to one of those podcasts that day and, and join in uh, with my prayer. I do plan to put that thing up by the 4th, so it will be available on the 5th. And uh, just go to my podcast, and you can listen in. Now, I have podcasts on the National Day of Prayer in 20 and 2020 and 2021. If you want to learn more what the pre- uh, National Day of Prayer is about, I encourage you uh, to go ahead and go over there and listen to those because you learn about the history of the National Day of Prayer. It actually goes back to George Washington. Uh, that's kind of where the concept came from. And it's, it is what it is today. But we, this nation has believed in prayer throughout its history. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise at all. So consider that uh, in the days ahead. If you like the channel, please subscribe. Uh, subscribing, sharing, liking the video certainly helps the channel grow. Um, I don't spend a lot of time asking people to do that. But what I'm interested in is getting the word of Jesus Christ out to the world. Uh, I do not make money off the channel. I'm not sponsored. Um, but I am a Bible-believing evangelical. I believe in the inerrancy, authority, and infallibility of the Scripture. I have since I was very young. It's not going to change. Uh, if you want to get Bible teaching, you may not agree with me on everything. We respect that. But on all the essentials, you better believe it. I'm right there on all of those. So I do want to say thank you for watching today's Denarius. Uh, Till the next time, may God bless you. And again, take time to pray on May 5th. Amen.